Hello and welcome back to Bookish Today. I wanted to continue my series about Ernest Hemingway by talking about an element of Ernest Hemingway's writing, which you don't see talked about a lot. It's not that I came up with this idea at all. If you looked on the internet uh, under Ernest Hemingway and repetition, you would find this. But I think it is one of the things that's somewhat overlooked about a style of writing. You know, people talk about short declarative sentences. They talk about the importance of dialogue in Hemingway. Talk about kind of the iceberg idea of Hemingway's writing that you know, most of the story uh, remains below the surface. You can kind of talk about the fact that the what appears to be happening in a Hemingway story isn't really what the story is about. But one of the things, and one of the ways in which I think he kind of conveys those things is through repetition. So I want to talk really quickly about Hemingway's use of repetition. I'm going to be talking about the use of repetition in two short stories. One, which I made a whole video about, Big, uh, Big Two-Hearted River. Um, uh, particularly looking at repetition of an image in part one. And then the second, I wanted to talk about how he uses that repetition in dialogue in A Cat in the Rain. So here we go. Um, in Big Two-Hearted River, if you watched the last video, you know that Nick Adams has gotten off a train. He's in the wilderness. He's returned home from war. And he is sat down on the side of the railroad track in a burned-out town. And so I just I wanted to read to you... Um, this and kind of get the idea, or read you some passage from this, kind of get to you, give to you the idea of how Hemingway uses repetition. Big Two Hearted River. The train went on up the track, out of sight, around one of the hills of burnt timber. Nick sat down on the bundle of canvas, be, canvas and bedding the baggage man had pitched out of the door of the baggage car. There was no town, nothing but the rails and the burned over country. The thirteen saloons that had lined the one street of Sini had had not left a trace. The foundations of the Mansion House Hotel stuck up above the ground. The stone was chipped and split by the fire. It was all that was left of the town of Sini. Even the surface has been burned off the ground. Nick looked at the burned-over stretch of hillside where he had expected to find the scattered houses of the town and then walked down the railroad track to the bridge over the river. So, in, you know, what amounts to just the first five or six sentences, we have Hemingway uh, using the term burnt uh, for temper. Uh, there was no town, nothing but the rails in the burned over country. Even the surface of the road, excuse me, even the surface had been burned off the ground. Nick looked at the burned over stretch of hillside. So he uses burned or burnt or burned over four times just in that first paragraph. Then on the next page, he returns to that theme. From the time he had gotten off the train, the baggage man had thrown his pack out of the open car door. Things had been different. Sini was burned. The country was burned over and changed, but it not, did not matter. It, cannot, it could not all be burned. So again, you see the repetition of the word burned three times. Now, maybe if you're not a Hemingway fan, you chalk this up as to just kind of lazy writing. He doesn't want to come up with a new term for the word burned or burnt. He, he just keeps repeating it. But what I think Hemingway reveals through repetition is part of the kind of subtext of the stories. It's it's Nick himself that has been burned. It's Nick that's been damaged. The fact that Nick keeps emphasizing that it was burned, and this is where he begins his journey, is symbolic of Nick beginning his journey away from his memories of the war, which have done him damage towards something else. By the way, also, uh, I just thought about this, but he also repeats this idea of his baggage being thrown out of the uh, out of the baggage car, and so that image of the baggage being tossed out, um, I think is is also somewhat symbolic of a couple of things. You know, the idea that Nick is carrying a burden, uh, that Nick has brought his burden with him, um, that nobody, uh, that other people don't understand the importance of that burden. I think this is all kind of a part of that discussion of the bag and the baggage. So again, I think you know, just in a just in the first page, you you have. Hemingway establishing this idea uh, that that Nick has been burned, that Nick feels like he's carrying a burden that other people don't respect or don't understand. I think that the repetition of that image, repetition of those words, accomplishes that. I also I think there's a good example of how that works in uh, how Hemingway does that in dialogue. 
in the story Cat in the Rain. So the story Cat in the Rain is essentially a story of marriage. Hemingway su- writes surprisingly writes a surprisingly large number of stories about marriage, and almost all the marriages he writes about are somewhat dysfunctional. And for all of the you know claims that Hemingway is a misogynist, claims which in another video I kind of addressed, I oftentimes find it kind of interesting that in all of in most of the Hemingway stories, I have to say, maybe not all, but in most of the Hemingway stories, it's the husband who's the source of the problem. It may seem that since the male characters seem to represent Hemingway um, and the female characters just represent you know, his idea of women, it may seem that, that Hemingway is trying to paint them out to be hysterical or to paint them out to be you know, high-strung. But in reality, I think what you find in these stories is that the men in these stories are oftentimes just jerk. Jerk. So this is a really short story. Cat in the Rain is only, uh, it's not quite three pages long. Um, and it tells the story of a married American couple who are traveling in, in Spain. And they're more or less trapped in their hotel room uh, at the Spanish hotel overlooking a courtyard and a statue. They're more or less trapped in this um, in this hotel room by rain. Uh, the man, George, is reading. And the woman is looking out, out the window. And while she's looking out the window, she notices under one of the tables in the courtyard a cat that's there sheltering from the rain. And she becomes kind of obsessed with this cat. The American wife stood at the window looking out. Outside, right under their window, a cat was crouched under one of the dripping green tables. The cat was trying to make herself so compact that she could not be dripped on. I'm going down and get that kitty, the American wife said. I'll do it, her husband offered from the bed. No, I'll get it. The poor kitty out trying to keep dry under a table. So notice that the woman here, when she's talking to George, she refers to the cat as a kitty. She does go down uh, to get the cat. She, you know, walks past hotel staff. She, she thinks about, uh, she, she describes, or there's a description of her feelings about the uh, the man who runs the hotel and how she likes him and how solicitous he is of her, which I think is intended to kind of be a juxtaposition uh, with her husband. Um, and then she enlists the help of a hotel maid try- who holds an umbrella over her while she tries to go out and get the cat. By the time she gets out to get the cat, the cat's gone. Uh, the wife says, uh, the maid says, a cat, the maid laughed, a cat in the rain? Yes. This is the, the wife. Yes, she said, under the table. Then, oh, I wanted it so much. I wanted a kitty. So she doesn't get the cat. But again, notices she calls it a kitty when she's talking about it out loud. She goes back up to her room, and her husband, George, says, Did you get the cat? He asked, putting the book down. It was gone. Wonder where it went to, he said, resting his eyes from reading. She sat down on the bed. I wanted it so much. I don't know why I wanted it so much. I wanted that poor kitty. It isn't any fun to be a poor kitty out in the rain. George was reading again. So notice she's again referring to this cat as a kitty over and over again. I want you to think about the sound of that word and why that's what she keeps saying over and over again. She spends a little time looking at herself in the mirror. There's a discussion about her hair and whether she wants to grow her hair out long, which, by the way, I may make a video about Hemingway and women's hair. That may be my next one. And then she she's becoming increasingly kind of upset and you know the reasons aren't always aren't initially evident you know the conversation between her and her husband is getting more tense she says i want to pull my hair back tight and smooth and make a big knot at the back that i can feel i want to have a kitty to sit on my lap and purr when i stroke her yeah george said from the bed and i want to eat at a table with my own silver and i want candles and i want it to be spring and i want to brush my hair out in front of a mirror and i want a kitty and i want some new clothes Oh, shut up and get something to read, George said. He was reading again. His wife looked out the window. It's quite dark now and still raining in the palm trees. Anyway, I want a cat, she said. I want a cat. I want a cat now. If I can't have long hair or any fun, I can have a cat. George was not listening. He was reading his book. His wife looked out of the window where the light had come on in the square. Someone knocked at the door. Avanti, George said. He looked up from his book. In the doorway stood the maid. She held a big tortoiseshell cat, pressed tight against her, and swung down against her body. Excuse me, she said. The padrone asked me to bring this for the signora. So notice a couple of things. She she insists on calling this cat a kitty, and she repeats the word kitty over and over again. But I think it's clear that kitty 
means baby, that what she wants is a baby, what she wants is a child. You'll notice that she also, when she starts listing things she wants, she wants her own silver, she wants her own table, you know, she wants to be in control of her own hair. You know, I think these are these are things where she apparently wants some level of domesticity and some, some normality, but what she clearly wants is some kind of a family, and she wants a child. You know, immediately after George tells her to shut up and find something to read, she looks out the window again, and then she doesn't refer to it as a kid anymore, and now it seems to be just a cat. Anyway, I want a cat, she said. I want a cat. I want a cat now. If I can't have long hair or any fun, I can have a cat. And then, of course, the the uh, hotel manager sends a, finds the cat and sends it up to her, and she gets her cat, which probably isn't going to be very satisfying. But again, I think the repetition of the word kitty, and I didn't count how many times she says kitty, but I'm going to say it at least seven or eight times. In a relatively short story, she repeats that word over and over again. I think clearly kitty is a stand-in for baby. And even though that's nowhere mentioned in the story, I think it's clear that I think Hemingway makes it clear by repeating it over and over again that that's really what she's talking about. And that's how he uses repetition to convey meaning and to, you know, impart the message of the story without even saying it. So those are my two examples of how Hemingway uses repetition. There are countless examples, at least from Hemingway's early work, of him doing exactly that, some of which, by the way, are, are probably more famous. And if you look it up online, you can see examples of that too. But I wanted to use these two stories, Big Two Hearted River, uh, with the word burned and this constant repetition of it to give you an idea of how Nick feels, how he is doing psychologically, and then the repetition of the word kitty to convey the message that this is a woman unhappy in her marriage who, who wants a child. Anyway, let me know what you think about uh, my interpretation. Let me know what you think about Hemingway's use of repetition to convey meaning. And thanks for watching.